this conversation and welcome. I hope you're all doing okay in whatever version of that word speaks to you at this moment. Um, we're just gonna dive right in and welcome uh, these incredible women to this conversation. Marissa Wolf, wave Marissa. Hi. <laughs> Marissa Wolf is artistic director of Portland Center Stage. We have Hannah Sharif, who's artistic director of the Repertory Theater St. Louis. And my colleague and my sister, um, Ariana Afsar. Ari Afsar, who is composer, lyricist, activist, all the things. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks it's for exciting. having the invitation. Yeah. What fun. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how this came about and kind of what we're talking about and then we'll just start talking. Well, I'll probably start with a little bit about how you come to the theater and how you find yourself in the positions you are, where does where does theater begin for you. But first, um, all of this came from a question from one of my uh, um, one of the viewers of one of my playwriting classes, and she reached out to me asking if um, I would host something about feminism in theater, talk about it. Um, it was really important to her to understand that. Um, she is a writer on the younger end of things, so I think coming into this field with eyes wide open. Um, and so she wanted to, to ask some of kind of the best in the, in the business and the, the best leaders um, that I knew and all of you came to mind immediately. And thank you for saying yes on the same date, no less. Um, so that's what we're gonna do here is kind of talk about what feminism uh, means to us, if it means anything, has the meaning changed, how it applies to what you do in the theater, how you come up with shows, direct shows, pick seasons, work with people, um, just how that has kind of grown and um, know that our audience is about we're learning and kind of what's now and what's next and how to be excellent at what we do and as people doing it. Um, so those kind of answers I think will be really helpful. Um, but why don't we start first kind of introducing ourselves by way of telling like how we come to the theater um, and then we'll pivot into kind of how your relationship with, with feminism. Ari, would you, would you start? How do you come to this crazy business? Uh -huh. Um, I, I mean, I grew up doing theater, uh, primarily identifying as an actor and singer um, throughout my entire childhood. Um, most recently, I originated the Chicago production of Eliza, um, no, Hamilton, of Hamilton as Eliza. <laughs> That's the second musical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not right. Um, and that was uh, uh, in 2016, a month before the November 2016 election happened, which kind of instigated um, the desire for Je uh, Jeanette, which is the musical that uh, Lauren and I are composing and working on. Mm -hmm. um, Hannah, would you tell us about how you come to the theater? Yeah, you know, I, I also loved the theater growing up. I was a writer um, and I would say that I was a writer first. Um, and I gravitated towards playwriting when I was very, very young. Um, and then I was 19 in, in undergrad when I launched the Scrappy Theater Company with my friends. Um, we'd lost our head of department who was really beloved. And our class in particular was a class where basically every professor that was there my freshman year of college was not in the department by my senior year. Mm. So there was no one kind of tracking your progression. And we just decided that we weren't gonna let our education be kind of caught in this transition, that we were gonna take control of it. And I became a co-founding artistic director of Nasir Productions at 19. Um, <laughs> and ran that company for um, about seven years, um, which is really, I would say, you know, if I was to look at the trajectory of my career, I would say that I wouldn't be artistic director of Allure Theater now if I hadn't run that scrappy company, because all of the skills of wearing all the hats um, really helped me become a great producer. And so mm -hmm. um, I went to grad school and then I went into the regional theater and I've spent like the last 20 years of my career producing and uh, am in, in just ending my first year as artistic director of the rep. Congratulations on that. <clears throat> Sorry it had to end with a <laughs> global crisis. pandemic. It's no big deal. <laughs> you know, it's fine. It'll be fine. Um, Marissa, tell us how you come to the theater. Yeah, so um, similarly, um, I started as a kid. I, I fell in love with um, theater at a very young age. And um, for my whole sort of childhood into my college years, I thought that I wanted to be an actor. And then it was in college that I 
sort of began recognizing like what a director is or can do and, and, and the opportunity to kind of take a world whole and shape it and question it. Um, and it was also an undergrad that I began to think like, ah, the work, the work is in shaping a whole kind of body of work. The work is in, mm. um, uh, you know, leading, leading companies and kind of being part of a national dialogue in that way. So I, I it was pretty early on that I thought, oh, that's, I think where I, that's where I'm heading. Um, and so I, I was in the Bay Area then in my early career and, um, yeah, interned all over the place. And um, like Hannah also ended up um, uh, after I was, I had opportunity to be at Berkeley Rep as the directing fellow. And then I was running Crowded Fire Theater, which is still an incredible thriving company run by Mina Morita. Yay, uh, yay Crowded, Crowded Fire. Fire. <laughs> That's where Lauren and I um, met and yeah. collaborating. And I think, you know, the indie, the indie theaters um, are, you know, are the best and are where so much exciting work gets generated in this country. And so I'm really, really proud to have done that for six years. And, yeah. uh, and then I was um, at Kansas City Rep as the associate um, AD. And then now I'm about 18 months into my tenure as the AD at Portland Center Stage in Oregon. And oh um, super happy to have Hannah and many other <coughs> amazing folks in this cohort of new artistic directors as we sojourn into the unknown. Eric Ting, um, in a conversation we had, I think it was last week, but what is a week anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I think some <laughs> amount of days ago, I um, talked about this uh, incredible flood of new generative creative voices, many of whom are women, many of whom are people of color, thank goodness. And to be, to see this, this class of, of, you know, of leaders be faced with this in their early tenures is kind of mind boggling. But his point was, I mean, awesome. I mean, I, I trust you um, to iterate and pivot and bring all of your creativity and energy more than anybody. Um, I know it's not exactly what you must have dreamed about for your first season or season and a half in these new exciting positions, but um, we're all behind you and all, all here thinking about what's next with, with y'all at the helm. Um, so this pivots to a question of what we're talking about, feminism. What is it? What is it to you? Um, and I think this can kind of be whatever we want it to be. But I, I may just start with my, an example of, um, of my way into feminism. And I will say I, I want to be an actor. I think a lot of us wanted to be an actor at first. And remember tracking, OK, I want to be an actor. And I, I didn't even consider playwriting or, or any other thing. But thinking like, well, gosh, I just what are the roles and looking through Shakespeare and mm. finding some, some good ones. And then kind of looking through modern American theater and being like, is it, is this, it? This, this all we have? Oh, all right. And especially for young women, because young women are always, you know, the girlfriend, the whore, the, the extra, the sister, you know, that gets shushed and moved off or something. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, okay, well, it seems like you got Scout, you've got Annie and we're done. <laughs> so, you know, um, so it, it kind of a dawning realization. I didn't have the articulation or the words to really describe what I was what I was sensing in my own art form. Um, and so, of course, just turned Shakespeare is full of really interesting women and is often done in a, in a gender bendy kind of way. So I was more like, well, I'm just going to read Hamlet and kind of practice on that <laughs> instead of instead of Ophelia. Um, yeah. And then moving into writing, realizing, oh, I guess we still write plays now, or some people do. That's great. Maybe we can just write ones that I want to do. <laughs> write ones for me or people like me or oh okay so finding that connection but it really wasn't until after I graduated at Emory that I realized that fe feminism was me that 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 was a word that I could associate with and own and I think I, I won't say a lot of us but for me it was something I didn't really think of needing um which is such a privileged thing to even say uh but then realizing talking to my mom oh my mom was one of those 80s moms who had to do everything who had to excel she was in, in, in um, medicine and excel as a mom and excel as the homemaker and excel as the wife and do all the things and nobody kind of even said are you doing okay do you need some help um 
anyway, but it, it kind of took me a while. I like to think of myself as a young sprightly, but what I, what I was when I was younger was a tomboy. I just was one of the guys. I was the girl who's with all the guys and preferred that. I didn't feel a sisterhood. I didn't have a group. I mean, I had a group of friends, but I considered myself like, I'm at my best when I'm with the guys and can like run with them and talk with them and be in the conversations and be in whatever. And so it was only later that I realized like, oh no, I'm a capital F feminist. And then of course, learning what intersectional feminism was and all of the kinds of feminism and the, all of the waves and all of the, the ways that we share that. But it took me a little while, but it was right around when I was writing Exit Pursued by a Bear, which was my first production at Crowded Fire with Marissa. Um, and it was the wildest play I'd ever written. And it really cracked me open in terms of saying, no, I write comedy. I can write political, feminist comedy. And I'd never really put myself in that place before because I was writing history plays about women scientists and women, but kind of like, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have worn that shirt. <laughs> and now I do. And so it really took me writing those plays with the indie companies that Marissa um, um, was talking about to crack into my ability. And now that's all I want to do, all I want to talk about, all I want to help other women realize and other men realize they're inner feminists. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I come to, to, to this discussion now. And it's so important. And I see chances to discuss it and, you know, correct it, but discuss at least in all the time in every theater settings with audiences, with commissioning, with, um, you know, plays that we are um, offering to students, like here are the American plays you should read. Well, like, let's make sure that Lorraine Hansberry is not the only woman that we get to read or, you know, anyway, so all, all on and on, I feel like we're, we're, and then seeing again with your generation of leadership, finally, we have so many examples of incredible women. So anyway, that's a little bit of my feminist journey. Love that. Um, yeah. um, do you want, we're gonna go backwards around the circle again, Marissa, do you want to start with kind of, what is it to you? What is the idea the word? How, what, mm. what does this mean to you? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, the sort of broad definition I feel like is, is, um, to me is, is feminism is that all people are equal, period. You know, we would use the word woman, that women are equal to men, but also then, of course, opening that up to this sort of gender spectrum. And so yeah. I would just say all people are equal, period. Uh, and then I also, I, I've been thinking about that in two ways. One is, um, you know, bringing a lens and at PCS, um, since I got there, and there's a lot of um, really fantastic sort of deep dive work around racial equity um, and anti-racist um, work. And um, there's a question that I think is really, it, it's really fruitful um, also with the lens of feminism, which is who in every choice you're making, particularly as a leader, um, but in every choice you're making as an artist to ask the question, who is burdened um, and who mm -hmm. is benefiting from this choice? And for me, when I started um, carrying that lens, um, it made, it, it, it put in stark relief the moments uh, in which I could so easily lean towards something that felt easier um, because it was normalized, you know, um, uh, and, and so it's deep, rich work. Um, and that feels really important. And it also makes me think in terms of, you know, sort of bringing a feminist lens to, to all aspects of life, particularly around theater and performance, the question of whose stories are we lifting up um, and who, who gets to tell those stories and how are we kind of cracking them open? Who's on that team? Who's on that stage? And who's in the audience? Um, I love that work. It's never ending. And, um, you know, mistakes will be made all the time. And I'll, you know, just own that uh, as a white girl and, you know, that and as a cisgender um, woman, like um, mistakes will be made uh, even within our own practice of intersectional mm -hmm. feminism. And um, we have to take deep breaths and, and keep questioning and keep deepening and, and, and moving into that space. Yeah, how about you, Hannah? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think part of the key for me is this concept of intersectionality. Um, I feel like I grew up in a household um, where the multiplicity of who I am and how I walk in the world was, I was encouraged to deconstruct that, to name it and to have a language to it. Um, so I am African-American, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman, I am 
a daughter, a sister, and at this point, you know, a mother, a writer, a director. Um, and uh, what I would say as central for me is this concept of servant leadership. Mm-hmm. I also went, um, I come from a long line of Spelmanites, women who went to Spelman College in Atlanta, which is an all women's uh, college. My mother, my aunts, my cousins. Um, and so like, there was no question that that's where I was gonna go to school. Cause it's like, oh, that's where phenomenal <laughs> black women go. They go to Spelman because that's like the best education you can get. Um, and, and I think that's absolutely true because you are instilled from the very beginning in this concept of servant leadership and the idea of intersectionality and feminism. So there's a lot of um, actually tough conversations and deconstruction of the feminist movement from like the suffragettes forward and where do black women show up um, and how have all of these kind of movements across history affected uh, women, women of color, um, and I think the conversation gratefully in the last decade has also moved to include trans women and non-binary uh, folks along the gender spectrum. Um, and so I, I feel really grateful that I had a foundation that encouraged a lens that was really critical and constantly deconstructing so that when I came into my practice of art, it was embedded in how I experienced the work and also how I advocated from the very beginning when I was running my own company. And then, you know, when I moved into the regional theater, the only person of color full time when I started at the theater that I started at Hartford Stage. And I was the um, one of two women in the artistic department. The other woman was actually artistic administrator who ended up going down the uh, management track rather than becoming a producer and so like the kind of sole curatorial female voice on a team of cisgender white men um and at a time in the american theater where we we're starting to kind of push back past the slot mentality where there's a slot for one slot for black and brown people and there's one slot for a woman playwright and then like we didn't even talk about like um uh native american asian trans that wasn't even part of the conversation and so entering that world and trying to find ways to be, to advocate and to subvert the norms um, became again, like an embedded part of the practice. Um, It didn't always make me popular. (laughs) Though my colleagues will say they loved that now in retrospect, it was great, we had these great debates, we had these great stretching moments, Um, but I really did feel like, um, and at the time that I became Associate Artistic Director in Hartford, I was the only woman of color in that position at Alert Theater in the country. And so like, I took my responsibility that access and platform delivered very, very seriously. And um, it was not easy and it was not, I, I think it's important to say this, that this journey, when you're trying to actually shift the, dynamically shift the standard by which we work is actually a really painful process. And it requires a lot of um, clarity of purpose and fortitude, and also just an acceptance that your heart is going to break a bit because you're pushing against a tremendous force. And that force is like, has been, if we're just going to name it, like um, cisgender, white, male dominated patriarchy, white supremacy. And so, um, all of us in the work that we do, I just want to honor the fact that that work is really hard, even when it's joyful, even when it fills your spirit, that there's the practice of creating and then there's the practice of pushing your creation into the world where it can encounter people. And um, sometimes that transitional process is the most difficult in our field. That's what I've experienced, but also the most essential, right? Because yeah. Marissa and I being in these positions is, is proof of that work, mm. I think. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's to, to think about when I was starting playwriting, the people to look to. Um, you know, it was it was few and far between, and I didn't even think of leadership. I was only looking at the writers and going, "Okay, Paula Vogel, excellent. Lynn Nottage, great." So I'm starting to like Sarah Rule, starting to you know, the Clean House was starting to do um, mm-hmm. so well around the country, and and looking at them and going, "Okay," and they all write so differently. But then I didn't even think to look at artistic directorship and, and you know, 
um, as a as a way like who's choosing these who's choosing these shows and and it's so it's the gatekeepers right. Yeah, I just want to say that feels to me really important because I do think that if we look at the trends over the last 20 years, there was a point where it was like, oh, it's really important to have like women on stage, right? And it's really important to have people of color on stage and, um, and maybe you'll get a director too, but maybe not, right? Because <laughs> there are a lot of um, woman-centric stories that were being told through the lens of white male directorship and there were, you know, the same was true for POCs. Um, and that in, you actually can't dynamically shift the field until the stakeholders and the people with power and the people who are decision makers are more diverse. And, and the rationale for that is that we don't know what the blinders are that we each carry, but we all have them. And so when you sit at a table with people who come to the work and, and move through the world in a different way than you do, they will come with the perspective you haven't thought of because they live in a body and they have an experience of the world that's, that is separate and different from yours. And that actually that's the thing that makes us most powerful and most cohesive and most transformative, right? Is when we are collectively um, drawing, so sorry, <laughs> collectively drawing um, that energy. And I think that um, there ha it's, it, we're just now really breaking through yeah. where you walk into most theaters and that kind of table of senior leadership, the people who get to decide who the designers are that are hired and who the directors are and who the playwrights are, are a more diverse group of people than they were for the last like, you know, 60 years of the American theater. Yeah, like forever. <laughs> but it's so critical. Still very small though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ari, do you want to talk to us about kind of how you come to your feminism if you choose that? And maybe a little bit about Jeanette because of what Hannah's saying seems very resonant about the conversation that we've had about depression too. Yeah, it's so interesting <laughs> just like the idea of feminists. I'll kind of go on a tangent before going into Jeanette. So I did, I competed at Miss America when I was 18 years old and I was on national television in a swimsuit. And um, it really affected what like feminism meant to me mm. and what it means to me. I'm also biracial, child of an immigrant, uh, South Asian Muslim family. So like that was also like a part of, you know, underlying everything. And it's really interesting. And at the, um, when I opened the Chicago production of Hamilton, I got really, really involved with the city of Chicago with the Women's March, United State of Women, Planned Parenthood. Um, and I was literally like volunteering, like just literally doing volunteer work because I needed to do that selfishly. It was very much a selfish reason. Um, and then I, and I actually spoke about my experience at Miss America and how it actually really, really shaped um, my perspective and idea of feminism. And then so empowered living in the US of fighting for feminism through such these beautiful organizations, which are of course under-resourced and underfunded, um, but they're, and, and completely criticized and um, ridiculed. But there's also this power and this camaraderie, right? And, and most recently I went um, back to visit my family, which I had not seen uh, since I was a child in Bangladesh. Um, and my whole idea and perception of what I thought of feminism is completely stripped, right? And completely stripped. And, and, this, and this is my family. This is my family and whom I live with and, you know, in, in the villages of Noakali. And, um, and, and, and it just like made me also check myself of like, America has a lot of shit that we have to fucking work on. And we have so much recognition and reconciliation that needs to happen. Um, but it's also just specifically for me, so close to home of how that could have just easily been a different life for me. And so this idea of feminism, uh, I think is also really indicated by um, where you live. Uh, and, I, and, and, and my perspective and idea of feminism for only being a Bangladesh for three weeks had to shift uh, based on where I was. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of been my understanding and, you know, I'm still learning and still trying to define what that means. And I think it's ever growing as our society is changing and um, as we're starting to see change. Now the issue in, in, in which Hannah was bringing up, I'm sorry, Hannah uh, mm -hmm. was bringing up, um, this idea of now what's, what I fear and what I see and feel is tokenism that's becoming very prominent in theater, right? And so there are moments as an actor in which I haven't completely switched over to stop being an actor, <laughs> which could happen much sooner than <laughs> I anticipated. Um, but uh, is this, this moment in this feeling where I know, where, you know, I, I'm not even gonna go into the, 
to like the idea of the limitations of a lot of female roles, but let's just even talk about the intersectionality of it, where you know that you're in this role because you're a person of color. And then also in, in kind of what Hannah was talking about, also because I am an Asian person of color now, right? Like that's now has become another token box where I'm like, oh, I'm the only non black person of color in this room. And that was also very purposeful, which is like a different idea of tokenism, which I don't even know how to break down. I don't know. I, the reality is we just have to have these conversations because I myself don't know what that means. Like at first it's also an opportunity, right? Like for the first time I could have never played this role five years ago. And um, so that's something, but I think the bottom line for me, what, what does this mean is, and, and why I turn to behind the table, who is behind that table? <laughs> right? It doesn't feel like tokenism. This is my perspective, but it doesn't feel like tokenism when you have a diverse creative team, because there are the different perspectives. And this is the whole thing. And, and I'll talk specifically about like a, a band, which I um, like the orchestra, the pit, right? Which is like a whole different conversation. We talk about the musician guild and how it's so white dominated and male dominated, but um, it's extremely important to me every time we do an iteration of Jeanette to have a diverse band. And it's not, and, 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 and the at least from my perspective, it's not for tokenism reasons, which I think sometimes could be the misconception. It's because the diverse perspectives and realities and situations that these individuals leave is going to bring for better music. Like the bottom line is for better music. And I think that, um, I don't wanna make a whole generalization, but m most of the time when you have diverse voices and perspectives, the authenticity of why it's happening is we're all just checking each other, right? We're all checking each other. We're all bringing our own thing. And if we are continuing to create in a homogenous um, environment, then we're not going to be able to check each other. We're not going to be able to bring innovative ideas and perspectives. And I think that's why I'm now shifting over to the other side of the table is so that we can create a world where the actors don't feel tokenized. And I, I mean, I remember when we were preparing for the O'Neill, <clears throat> you making very, very clear, it would be easy to get a band if they were all white. And you were like, no, we can do better. Keep asking. Nope. Keep asking. Nope. Keep asking. There's going to be some people. There's going to be people. <laughs> and you get yourself into a pickle. I, at the very end, I was very clear we needed a female person of color guitarist. And we did not have that until a week before. Mm -hmm. um, but we found Nishi, she was amazing. Then, we found the most incredible, and then um, from that experience, she then booked uh, a tour on yeah. um, uh, Spongebob. Like, it's just, touring show, yeah. This, yeah, and how can we empower and continue to create, and this is also the reality, right? Like um, the artistic director of the O'Neill, Alex Gemignani, uh, is a true ally to be able to, you have to also have people at the top that can support that type of decision and encourage um, and invite because it was also very scary. <laughs> We did not have a musician until the week before um, for yeah. our band, but I think it's like really, really important. And, and this is, I'm gonna kind of go off track, but like, this is where I think it's really important of like, where does theater and activism lie? And I think like, I was not able to grow as a composer or as an artist in any shape or form if I was not surrounded by beautiful activists and community organizers through the work, um, through me just shutting up and listening and volunteering. Um, I was, I it would not have been able to positively affect it in the same way. And, and really actually, it was like three weeks before, if we're talking specifically about that experience, I had an interview with the chief diversity officer of, um, her name is Wendy of New York City uh, for the uh, comptroller, New York City comptroller. And she, and she, I was talking about this at O'Neill and she was like, do not, she's like, you will find the person do not give up, you have to do that. It is your responsibility, right? And like, nobody else was gonna tell me that. It had to be somebody mm -hmm. out of the theater who had no idea what that entailed, no idea what that like dictation meant. Um, but then that challenged me to do better and be better. Do you, do all of you feel like your art is, is activism, is a kind of activism? Do you, do you perhaps not every play, but, but how, how does that sit with you in terms of what you do? I will say that I, um, th there's something about, I do see that the, the, there is a paradigm of like, either you're tearing down like, um, violent structures or you're upholding them. And so, you know, I think as a producer and director to be thinking about how is each project that we're putting on stage um, and every, you know, every muscle of like the artistic engine going towards 
um, not only tearing down the structures, but also um, creating and envisioning new worlds and new structures. So in that way, I would say that that, that for me is a pretty is a broad way of conceptualizing um, activism. I also think that um, there's something about you know, it was the first show I had the opportunity to program in the 1920 season when we had a 1920 season <laughs> um, was uh, in the Heights. And um, it was directed by the incredible Maya Dralis and the um, choreographers, William Carlos Angulo. Their production has been at a few other wonderful theaters as well. And um, that for me was like a, a, a powerful moment of living inside of um, essentially um, uh, protest through misery resistance, you know, through kind of like we are showing up, we are singing, we are visible, we are um, sort of catapulting uh, conversations inside this community. Um, and, and it was, you know, of course, like politically, it was, you know, just it was um, undermining all of the sort of daily barrage of hate and, and violence that was being spewed from our government and, and being put into practice mm -hmm. um, around the country. And so that to me, I mean, that's a very, I think it's a sort of gentle way of, 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 of talking about what's happening on stage and why the actual act of singing and dancing night after night was, I feel a political act. And it was just absolutely, um, spectacular. Um, so that's, that's my broad frame for activism. Yeah. What about you, Hannah? Complicated um, question for me. And I think that part of it goes, comes down to intersectionality and like the reality of lived experience. And also like, I have to be hyper aware of the unconscious bias that um, permeates the world that I'm in, right? So um, anti-blackness is just a thing. It just is. It's embedded in the history of our country um, and the legacy of it. And so, um, you know, one of the differences I would say is like, uh, and, and not always, but there are things that Marissa might be able to say and do that would be perceived as me having a massive agenda mm -hmm. um, that would complicate my ability to do the work. So if you were to say, do I think of every piece of work um, that I create either as a producer or a director or a playwright as being a work of activism, I would say um, that's not the lens that I use for the work. Um, I, I actually think it's more um, fundamental in a way than that. Um, I'm gonna honor Sharifa Joka. We were at a conference um, and she's a diversity, she's the director of equity at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And specifically, we were talking to a group of managers about diversifying the American theater. And they were saying, well, you know, the problem is like, we just can't find y'all, right? Like the problem <laughs> is that, you know, there's no one really qualified that's out there. And, you know, it's a panel of like really talented POCs speaking. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then the other concept that was being put forward was like, well, we actually need like a special committee and we need special funding to go find talented POCs and women. And Sharifa introduced this idea of the keys and she used this metaphor. She's like, you know, um, the first thing is actually just believing. That's the first thing, you just have to believe. She's like, you know how when you lose your car keys in your house, because you know the car keys exist, you believe the car keys exist, that you don't like go call the dealership and ask them to print you new keys or manufacture something. You turn over every cushion, you look under the blankets, you crawl under the TV stand and you find the keys because you know the keys exist. It's not that there aren't talented, qualified people. It's that you actually haven't done a very good job of attracting them. You haven't done a very good job of recruiting them because you don't believe that they exist. And so the way I translate that to um, the way I approach every piece of art. So like when I was programming my first season for the rep, um, one of the 
a journalist said, well, I see that your season is just so diverse. And was that your agenda? And I said, you know what I did? I said, I want to produce the best of the American theater. I want to bring the most impactful, talented, innovative voices forward. And aren't we so lucky that we live in a country where the best of the American theater actually looks like this? That because I understand that excellence can show up in every body in every color, and I don't limit myself to the idea that there might be one woman playwright that could be on our stage, or there might be one Latinx playwright that could be on our stage, or that if I choose that show, I couldn't possibly have an all Latinx design team because you couldn't possibly put together five designers that are super talented. Like, because I just don't believe that. And I choose to move from the space of believing in um, this concept of abundance, um, that if anything is a political act, it's that foundational space of believing that we exist, believing that the world is abundant and that I don't have to have a scarcity mentality and believing that um, I've been hired because I'm an expert in the field and that my concept of what excellence is, is one that my community should see. And so um, I frame it in that kind of foundational sense of like, what is the best? What is the why we do theater? And how does this answer the why? And if I am as open and abundant in my belief in the why, then all things are possible. I love that so much. And to, I mean, to me, the word abundance, when we talk about who's getting the jobs, who's getting the, the chance to tell us the stories um, is actually similar to Marissa, what you're talking about within the Heights, that by leading with, yes, this is gonna be great. That to me is, musical, that's comedy, it's romance. It's finding a way to talk about these things, not ignoring the incredible trauma and the necessity of, of addressing those, those issues in our, in our country, but also to say, and there is more to being, we had a conversation with two amazing trans artists last week and they were saying, there's more stories than ours about coming out and the trauma of a family that rejects you and dying because of who you are. There are, we do other things. <laughs> and, and how much drama there is in, in a love story that is not white, cis, straight, you know, all of that. <laughs> and, and all of those things, the way that theater works its best is going like joy can bowl you over with a new, a paradigm shifting new experience of a culture or um, a lived experience that's not yours. And using that as well as you know, in, in some of the subtler ways, I think about Miss Bennett and that play mm -hmm. is done often and there's an encouragement to do that with a diverse cast. And even though that is not the edgiest political drama in American theater, you get a lot of female bodies on stage and they look very differently and it's amazing. And every time the season comes where we start seeing pictures around the country, including yours, Marissa, last week, which uh, yeah, was, was awesome. such an amazing cast. Um, it just fills me with such delight because it's like, see, just do it. Just put yeah. just put people up there and make them fall in love and make them laugh and make them, you know, and, and that does its own kind of work, which I, I think is really, really interesting. Ari, do you want to speak to this as well? Yeah, kind of off of what you all are saying, I think um, this is no endorsement or whatever it may be, but it was a shift for me when I heard when he was vice president, Joe Biden, um, state that the American population did not take gay marriage seriously until Will and Grace. It uh, shifted the responsibility of art for me. Um, and I think that me personally, art is supposed to change culture. That's how we change policy. And um, I think whether it be hit on the head or whatever, I mean, there's so many different ways to be doing it, but I think that is the purpose of art. Art is supposed to inspire and change the either make a commentary or see a world in which we want to live in whatever it may be whatever that means to you but like true escapism art I actually don't like <laughs> um and I think that it I think that that just lies in and I in the DNA of what art means mm -hmm. I want to just add actually to this to that this beautiful comments is that it makes me think about um Lorraine Hansberry said everything is political yeah. And I go back right. to that all the time because it, everything we choose to stage is, is political. Mm -hmm. um, and so right down to Miss Bennett, you know what I mean? The, 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 all of the choices around that. And it also makes me think of, um, I got to hear Lisa Crone speak um, a year ago at Profile Theater here in Portland. And 
um, she was asked about like sort of like the, the, her political body of work. And she had this beautiful, because not all of her plays directly deal with politics, you know. Um, and she had this beautiful thing where she said something like, for me, the political act was recognizing that a voice like mine could be central in the play. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think that that just sort of supports what, what, what everyone's saying, that I just, I just love that. Um, yeah, the, yes. See, and it's interesting because what, what you brought up also, I, the best quote for me about this is Toni Morrison saying all great art is political. And I think mm. it's the great, you can have art that's not political. It's not going to be great if it's not. And, and I've been challenged in many talkbacks by many, mostly white now people about this concept. Um, but to me, it, it really does. It, it's exactly that. You can get fine art, art, but great art is inherently talking about the populace. It's talking about our mm -hmm. civilization. It's talking about the now, the then, in what context you have to have art. Um, but like to get great, you have to engage because mm -hmm. it's too easy. Otherwise, easy art isn't great art, right? Also, mm -hmm. and what's the point of why? Yeah, what's the point? Why, why then there really should not be a purpose for art. Mm -hmm. That may yeah. be a dramatic statement, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you, you're a tiny bit dramatic. It's great. <laughs> I also just want to say, like, I I love being on this call. I love um, Marissa and I are in a couple of other uh, circles of support together. And I love every time uh, we get to engage because the other thing that I think about in terms of like, what does it mean to be a feminist? Um, and how does that show up in our work? I think it is also about the way we amplify each other's voices. Yeah. And we, yeah. you know, and if we're looking for that validation to come from a system that didn't want us here in the first place, it's not going to happen, but we can actually create our own kind of third party validation of each other and kind of create a new norm and a new standard by the level of like engagement and support and, um, and this like, again, uh, the sense of abundance, like instead of everyone trying to figure out their secret way of winning or getting through <laughs> a, a crisis on their own, yeah. like I don't, six great brains are better than my one. So I want all six, like I want to, I want to share, I want to, I want to borrow. Um, and yeah. it's just been so wonderful. I think one of the things I love about our cohort is that there is the sense of like, we are in it together and my success and your success are intrinsically tied to each other. And yep. it's such a beautiful way to make art. Like that kind of interdependence that is core to the way that we actually create art being part of every level of um, the systemic parts of our business feels exciting and in some ways really fresh and new. Um, I wanna talk for a tiny bit, thank you for that. That does make such great sense and it does gives me more joy than anything just to be like, yes, do it, go, yes, everybody go see this, everybody go see that, show up, woo. Um, which feels like the, the entire reason of these like Zoom interviews is to be like, you're awesome and you're awesome and you're awesome too, let's tell the world about it. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, I wanna talk to Hannah Avery who inspired this entire conversation. A couple of her questions, which maybe we can just kind of popcorn. Um, she's interested in this idea of unlikable female characters um, because she mm. likes to write them and she, or I think probably she writes characters and then people tell her they are unlikable, which has happened to me so many times. Mm. Um, and so this idea of what even that means, or perhaps we just share our ways of snipping that word out of our vocabulary or calling it out when somebody says that and being mm. like, is Hamlet very likable? Do we call him unlikable? No. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, also this idea of, she asked about initiatives for more female voices. I think she's asking from a playwright's perspective, um, perhaps the playwright's responsibility in this, how to find people who are looking for to tell um, stories uh, from female or female identifying voices, which I think there are many now, thank goodness, but maybe you can share some. And then lastly, her question about male directing, male directors of female work. Um, and she had an experience that seemed not great for her mm -hmm. in that. <laughs> um, Kind of what you're talking about about seeing a lot of female plays um, through a male lens and um, how that still feels not the progress but those are her three kind of um, questions that she brought up that maybe we can spend a tiny bit of time talking about so unlikability uh, initiatives for writers of female stories and male directors and I guess it's a question of allyship too so do you do y'all have any questions about that or any thoughts about that I can talk about unlikability because there are several of my characters <laughs> who've been talked uh, 
use that word. And I, again, use the one I just said about Hamlet being likable. Mm -hmm. Is King Lear very likable? Is Macbeth very likable? Um, mm -hmm. There are the Willie Loman. I mean, come on, you can go on and mm -hmm. on and on. And the whole idea of complexity and unlikability, I think calling out the differences that we have where we would call a male, a male character um, with the exact same attributes, um, something different, something wiser, something more mm -hmm. with more gravitas. And if it's in a female body, it's like, well, they're shrill, they're annoying. It's the Hillary Clinton thing. It's like everything mm -hmm. that makes her talented makes her unlikable. And just trying to, I would say to all of you out there, if this this is a conversation that happens to you, just call out the use of the word. And you know, whether mm -hmm. that's like me and I just make a joke of everything and thus, because I'm, I'm not, not great with per personal conflict. So making a joke about it calls it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can be like, ha ha, right? We all agree, great, let's move on. Um, but, but yeah, and I think it's just calling out the language we use um, to compare um, uh, female characters or female identifying characters and male characters. I like to put people on the spot and like, oh, what do you mean by that? Like, what, what do you mean by unlikable? Like, not just how it compares to men, but actually like when you ask people to define it, it really often comes down to like women stepping outside of the societal approved role um, and, you know, it's kind of like what, what I will even say, like, as a, a woman in leadership, mm -hmm. the things that made me really great as a number two to the men that I worked for, um, are the same things that make me a great leader now, but also can be very challenging for folks because it's like, what, but you're not, <laughs> Um, you know, it's that 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 confidence in a woman, in a man is arrogance in a woman. It's you know, mm -hmm. and so for me, it's it's less me wanting to defend it and more like, hmm, why don't you tell me more about that? And just like deconstructing it down and then giving like when people say things that are you know fairly ignorant but they haven't quite heard it yet, I just like repeat it back to them. Yeah. <laughs> so did you really mean to say that women shouldn't lead? organization yeah. that women don't have leadership skills is that what you meant to say I'm, I'm gonna give you a moment just to rethink that and tell me if that's actually what you meant to say you know it's a little bit of like that's great that female character is challenging because she yeah. has an idea <laughs> yeah 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 um any of the other ideas about initiatives for female voices or male directors? I mean, I've had many great male allies work on mm -hmm. plays of mine. Some of my kind of go-to directors um, are men and they certainly are, I, all of them would consider themselves feminists um, and acknowledge if they don't know a thing, which I think is the best thing to be, is to be able to say, I don't know with as much confidence as when you do know something. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say I, I, have developed a crew of female directors because my work was often paired that way when I was younger. So I honestly didn't realize the quote unquote dearth of female directors because I was always paired with them. I was like, wow, there's all these great. So it, it, and I, it only occurred to me when I had actors would join a room. I remember this for Silent Sky and there were several actors were like, I've never been in a room, a rehearsal room where it's all women. I've never been ever in my entire career and you know, coming to a place and I was like, oh, I always am. Oh, maybe that's the plays I'm writing, which are all about women. Oh, great. <laughs> so, but yes, I think I think it, it it depends on the play, it depends on the relationship more than more than anything. Yeah, what do you I think there's a lot of nuance in that in that question, and um, and I think what I love is uh, I would say like what what Ari I love what Ari said about um, uh keep going or, and connected to Hana, what Hana saying about looking for keys, which is such a fantastic sort of <laughs> image and metaphor, um, which is, um, I don't know, the, the, the sense of, um, I think uh, if you're a writer, um, or I guess I should say, every director brings their own lived experience to, to the play. And so each, each director will unlock something different. And I do think um, probably like all of us, I absolutely have had experiences where I've, I've sat through a play and then I thought, and I've been like, ah, oh, gnashing my teeth because I feel like there's something that's not attuned to what the play is offering around, um, like a, a play written by a woman is, is offering that it, the interpretation, something's been lost. Um, if it hasn't been a, a female director at the helm. I've also like, you know, I have, many, many male collaborators and colleagues whose work I think is just spectacular and with the right um, 
the right collaboration and and perhaps like deep running long term respect between the 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 pairing um, cracks open other things you know that, that is utterly unique to them. But I but I do think that it's like everyone should every artists should be lucky enough to have a wide body of female directors um, or female identified directors who they are working with, period. Um, because yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's gonna unlock the work in different ways. I'll, I'll speak to the, I don't know if this is kind of like a nuance of the question, but um, in being pretty young in my career as a composer and also being 28 woman of color composer where there's um, not, really any uh and so um i think honestly i struggle with even the, you know in this safe space i'm able to really be in my body and uh have feel like i have authority to speak freely um, but that's not always the case and so especially in in the beginning you know i struggle with being able to hold my authority in rooms and um and it's a constant struggle and it's a constant battle. And I'm just learning like with age that it gets better and it gets easier. And so I, I think it's like really making sure in the choosing of your collaborators, wherever you, uh, whatever role that you fit, making sure that you can feel free to feel open and vulnerable um, because that's extremely important for the creativity, right? And, and it's like, even at the O'Neill, like a lot of, uh, I remember there were, um, while we were in presentations, nobody knew I was the, composer and so I was able to go in and he, like audience members didn't know and so I was able to like gum into conversations as if like I was just a go-getter and like hearing what their commentary was and I was like okay cool so this is a situation that is the reality this is just the reality so like let me try to use this to my benefit and I was able to like get intel of what they thought at the top of act two which is a really bold idea that we do in Jeanette you know what I mean and so it's like where are the little pieces of sliver because it's also it's I'm not even blaming the society it's like I haven't quite found my authority in my body to hold myself. And it's just gonna, I have to just continue to learn that. Yeah. On the advocacy tip, which I think is the third question. Yep. Um, you know, for me, it's like, I just do it, right? So I had two world premieres this year, hmm. both of them world premieres written by women of color. Um, and I just programmed them because I love the plays and I thought I want to. <laughs> <laughs> and they mm -hmm. did well with the season and and the arc and all of that. But also um, I found um, by not talking about it, I don't give people a chance to label it as a thing, as a, yeah, right. you know, mm -hmm. um, as a kitsch thing. I, I want actually people just to like keep showing up and, and for it to eventually be something you don't even think about. And, you know, and there was a lot of conversation with like my marketing department, like, well, should we talk about how many women directors we have and how many, and I was like, no, let's not talk about it. Let's not, let's just do it. I am it. so with you, Hannah. Let's just so do interesting. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if people figure it out, if people are like, oh, oh my God, um, <laughs> exactly. then wait. And if they don't, that's also great because actually what I'm trying to say is that this is not crazy. This is not like spectacle or for show, this is actually just what the American theater looks like. Yeah, right. And I want this to become the norm. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm gonna normalize it mm -hmm. by not pretending that it's extraordinary. I'm gonna keep producing women writers and hiring women directors and hiring women lighting designers and sound mm -hmm. designers um, because fortunately, at least for the next three years, I can. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Yeah, I think we do. We just, we write it, we do. I mean, there's many plays that just if, they aren't gonna get written if you don't write them. And yeah. that means those roles aren't gonna be castable because you didn't write them. And the conversations aren't gonna be had because, you know, so I, I, I totally, I love that idea. Just do it and find the people. And if the people you're around are like, I don't know, then those are the wrong people. Find yeah. the other people. Yes. <laughs> I also you will find the people. To Ari, this idea, I sometimes feel like and it's embedded in the business. I think there's something about the way the business is created that is meant to try and keep the generative artists from fully living in the mm -hmm. truth of your power. But when you're the playwright and you're the composer and an organization has fallen in love with your piece, you know, you mm -hmm. can go to the carpet and advocate for the creative teams that you want um, and that you think are gonna serve your storytelling. And sometimes that will be all women and sometimes it won't be, you know, sometimes 
it is about finding the right chemistry for that play in that moment, in that production that you're trying to build. Um, and um, even if they push back, I, I, we push back, right? Like, because <laughs> I've been in the position where like, I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. And my AD is like, no, 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 no. I really want it to be this person. Keep pushing, right? In the same way you did for your guitarist. And I say this to all mm -hmm. of the writers out there, all of the generative artists, you, and this, you know, I was mentored in playwriting by Edward Albee, who was totally like the playwright is king. I don't care what anyone else in the American <laughs> theater is. Like there is no American theater without a playwright. Um, so there's a little tiny bit of that that's still <laughs> in my DNA. Um, but just know that like, especially with new work, your vision forward for how that piece needs to enter the world for the first time is so important. Um, and just own the fact that you're the generative artist that the seed of this entire world depends on that work being held and lifted in the way that you envision it. Um, because nine times out of 10, you'll get what you want. If you <laughs> yeah. Love it. We are closing in on our hour and I feel like we've just begun, but thank you all so much. Um, if there's any last thoughts, I mean, in my mind, it's kind of, it is feminism doesn't have to be the thing that we name or wear in our shirts like I'm doing. You can, but the idea of like living it, making it, um, being it is 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 it? You know, making those choices all the time um, about not just feminism but every kind of um, attempt and and journey towards equality and a justice seeking mind and mentality, especially around art. Like if the arts can't do it, then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. So um, that is, that's what I've taken away from this. Maybe some, some final thoughts. It's just a joy to hang out with you all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, truly, you know, it's really, um, it's very moving to, to dive deep so quickly in just an hour, you know, and I, and I was also taking some notes because I'm inspired by you. So thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. We should have a, we have, we should have a sidebar conversation. <laughs> totally. Sidebars and side, side drinks <laughs> later. We'll do this at 5 p.m. on everyone's side. Uh, <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Thank, for you. Thank you. so much, Lauren. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks so much for watching. More interviews to come. And uh, it's just such a great, great lift for my week um, to think about all the art that is to come during this time and after this time with all of these amazing minds at work in the world. So thank you so much. Be safe. And uh, thank you. I can't wait to read Jeanette whenever you're ready. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs>